And you're listening to Kent Franks. That is the clinical psychologist called by the defense to testify on the behalf of Nicholas Godijan. And it seems that what he's talking about, what he's an expert in, is autism and how autism impacts an individual's ability to understand, comprehend, and form relationships. And I guess the real question, we're going to bring in our expert in a moment. Uh, we have from uh, Florida, I think where it's uh, not snowing, is Jerry Gurley, who's a criminal defense attorney. Uh, thank you for being on with us. My pleasure. And uh, the problem I see, and you know, again, we'll see how the, the cross-examination goes, but it sounds like he's describing, first of all, um, not only just what autism does or how it impacts an individual, but specifically how it impacted Nicholas Godijan. One of the problems I see is that the testimony he gives is based on what Nicholas and his family tells him, and not really on evidence outside of that. So he's relying on what he tells him in order to make a determination as to exactly the extent of his ability or inability to understand, in a sense, right from wrong. Yeah. So in general, I think what he's trying to do with the, with the particular expert Dr. Franks is trying to do is to support the claim that the defense has made that he has diminished mental capacity, that he doesn't think like the ordinary Jane or Joe would think he's on the spectrum of autism. So he's putting forth that notion because it's important for the, uh, the jury to have some sense that he's not to be held accountable or ultimately what he's doing is making a play for what we call mitigation. But he also mentioned the, the different tests uh, that he administered. So I would like to hear more about those tests and what they, um, what they determine, what they show. Sure. And I think we're going to take a moment. We're going to take a break and then we'll come right back. And uh, while uh, Dr. Franks takes a look at his notes, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this with uh, Jerry Gurley out of Orlando, Florida. You with us, Jerry? I'm here. Uh, so, so you know, in continuation of what we were talking about, I think we're starting to hear now some of the tests that were given to Nicholas Godijan, and I, I think I think we can all agree uh, that this was a young man with, as you described, some level of diminished capacity. I guess the question I have, and I think the question obviously that's going to come out on cross examination, is how is this doctor's testimony in regards to the limitations going to impact the jury when they're making a decision about something, when they know that he made many decisions that were thought out, including the decision to go to the house, the decision to use the back door, the decision to use a knife versus a machete, like all those different things that while you don't need to be a rocket scientist, you certainly need the wherewithal to be able to have the mental ability to make a decision to kill someone. Absolutely. You know, the, the fact that someone may have some diminished capacity does not necessarily excuse him uh, from his actions. The real question ultimately in an, in an ultimate defense would be uh, insanity, but that's certainly not what they're claiming here. In an insanity defense, you're saying I was not able to conform my actions to the requirement of the law. I didn't know what I was doing. I, nothing that I've heard from this doctor at this point would indicate that he was completely unaware that his actions were right or wrong. In fact, what I've heard is a lot of uh, testimony that relates to his social impairment more so than his cognitive impairment. So again, I'm listening, but I don't think we've got there so far with this testimony. I agree. So let's take a look. Let's see if it gets any further. And the doctor just came to a conclusion. I want to talk to Jerry, if I can, for a moment about it. He s said that he has autism spectrum disorder level two with, that requires substantial support, which means that he needs supervision. Um, and this, these were the findings of this doctor. And the, and the question I, I have to ask is, many individuals, Jerry, have autism to this extent. But those individuals don't go out and stab someone to death. And so how does the defense delineate why it is that this individual that has autism, like many individuals who do function in society, chose to do what he did uh, and, and made that decision versus someone else who chose not to make such a decision? 
Well, first of all, that, that particular witness has not addressed that completely. I, I, sus I suspect that what the defense is doing here is putting together the different components. And so this witness function was simply to show that he had the diminished capacity, that he was somehow uh, easily manipulated. And you're going to have to add to that some other testimony or some other evidence to get to the conclusion that uh, he was, um, he should not be held responsible for the murder. But I haven't heard it from this witness yet. Right. Yeah, no, and, and, and I think one of the things you were talking about before when we were when we were on break was, you know, the, the, the people that are watching have to remember this isn't just a decision about the guilt or non-guilt of this defendant for the top count. The other question is, even if the jury comes back with murder in the first degree, the jury's the one that's deciding what the appropriate sentence is. Um, how do you think this may impact them when it comes to a decision like that, assuming they come back with the top count? Well, assuming that they do, and I would just add that the, the, the first thing that the defense attorney is trying to do is to convince them that although this was a death, this is something less than murder, second degree, manslaughter, whatever. Uh, that's the number one goal. But the second goal is that even if it is first degree, because of all of these things that you've heard, and we are not excusing him, but we can at least uh, punish him less because he's not your average ordinary guy. So that that's mitigation, right? That's you, you, you're saying, look, here are the, the extenuating factors that you should take into consideration. He needs to be punished, but not uh, as severely as the, the average person. I think it's I, I think it's going to be very interesting. Interesting. We're going to go to a break, but it's going to be interesting to see what the prosecution does on cross examination with this doctor. Let's take a break, and we'll be right back. And before we head on back into the courtroom, where we have Dr. Jerry Grant testifying, he's the defense clinical psychologist. He's testifying in regards to um, evaluations he did of Nicholas Godijan. We're going to talk a little bit with criminal defense attorney um, Jerry Gurley. Uh, do I have you still with me, Jerry? Here. Okay, yes. I'm having a little trouble hearing, um, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, and so one of the things that happened before this doctor testified is that we had Gypsy on the stand. And Gypsy, Blanchard, who's the one that we've all kind of been waiting for, is the child of Dee Dee Blanchard. And she testified for the defense. And there's been a lot of talk about what a fantastic job the prosecution did. And it seems that the defense called her in order to at least get the jury thinking that she was the mastermind behind this, she wanted it done, and that he simply followed her lead, although the prosecution seemed to break that down in a way that destroyed that theory by indicating that he made a lot of his own decisions about things that were to be done, and therefore she's not responsible for the decisions he made. Right. You know, the prosecution evidently did a good job of, of demonstrating that he was not the victim. I mean, obviously, um, what the defense attorney was angling for was that there was more than one victim here. But the, the state of Missouri, had, uh, in their cross-examination, broke it down. You know, it's interesting. I was listening to the testimony of the doctor, and he said that one of the aspects of, of, of the defendant's um, disorder is that he Ha he can't move from one place to the next very easily. But if I'm not mistaken, the evidence is that he lived in Wisconsin and traveled to Missouri to commit this crime. Oh, he moved all right. So, you know, that testimony largely undermined um, the theory of the case that he's a victim. And, and I'm again, I'm having trouble here saying how they're going to get to their desired destination with this line of, of, of testimony. It's interesting because, you know, one of the things I wanted to hear almost exclusively from Gypsy, and I thought, again, I, you know, I can't Monday, Monday morning quarterback um, what I would have done as a defense attorney, but I guess I might as well, is that to me the biggest thing is what Dee Dee Blanchard did to this girl. And so if I were the defense, I think that I would have spent a lot more time with Gypsy laying that out so that the jury had a better sense that this young man thought he had to save her. Not that he just simply wanted to be with a girl who he couldn't be with because the mother was in the way, but that he really had to save a girl from 
absolute dire danger of being in the hands of her mother. And so I'm curious, you know, I, I even noticed this in the defense's opening arguments, that they really didn't hit home how abused Gypsy was. I think that, look, who knows, but I think that would have been something that could have helped them. You know, maybe they were concerned um, that, you know, that's, that's a slippery slope. I mean, it could come across if you're not careful and if you're not adept at doing that. And I fully understand what you're talking about. And, and what I tell my, my clients when I'm going to trial is that uh, if you're the bad guy, we're not going to trial. We're going to resolve it some other way. And sometimes you have to make the alleged victim or the obvious victim some, someone who is less sympathetic. Um, but it's a slippery slope because if the jury gets the idea that you are uh, demeaning this person who's been uh, a victim of a crime, uh, they can become very angry and, and, and decide that they're going to do everything that they can to vindicate this person. So you have to be careful. Um, and it just seems like they're going in, in the air, they're, they're going to err in, on the side of caution, I guess. That's the approach that they're taking here. Yeah, and I think it's always, when we talk about the slippery slope, it's always dangerous to err on the side of caution when it comes to a murder one um, potential conviction. We're going to take a look now a little bit at Gypsy Blanchard's testimony. Let's take a look. And that's uh, some prior testimony of Gypsy Blanchard. We're um, presently still have uh, Dr. Franks on the stand. And before we take a break, I just want to talk to Jerry, um, Jerry Gurley a little bit more about uh, this testimony. So, you know, here we have her talking about the fact that she had a relationship with this young man, that she was providing money for him so he could come visit her because she didn't think he had money on his own. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things, obviously, that we know is eventually going to come out is that the cross-examination of this young woman is going to show that, in, in a sense, there was a point in time where Gypsy was the one offering up options other than murder in order to resolve or potentially get her to be able to be away from Dee Dee, her mother. And to me, this doesn't necessarily bode very well for the defense. What are your thoughts? Well, again, just listening to that, that segment of, of the of Gypsy's testimony, it doesn't create the level of sympathy or understanding in terms of why we get to, how we get to murder from these facts, these circumstances. Uh, what that says to me is they were sitting around brainstorming about what they could do and, and murder just should not have come up. How did it come up? We don't know. Uh, but we have, we would have to hear a whole lot more. I, I, that's where I come down on this. Yeah, I, have... I, I agree with you. Now, look, we don't know if the judge was limiting the opportunity of the defense to bring out all the brutal details of what happened to Gypsy Blanchard throughout her life. But one would think, as the as the defense attorney, I would be pushing and begging and fighting tooth to nail to get in as much as possible so the jury really understood how it even came to be that Gypsy would think that this was the only option in her life. You know, there, those pesky rules of evidence uh, prevent that. Um, rule 403, where any probative value might be outweighed we're by... Gonna have to, we're going to have to cut you off and we'll be right back. And welcome back. We're waiting for uh, the jury to come back in on the Nicholas Godijan case where uh, the doctor is presently testifying. We just took a look at some of his prior direct testimony by the defense where he talked a little bit about, first of all, his background as a doctor and secondly, his analysis of Nicholas Godijan and, and where Nicholas Godijan falls in terms of the autism spectrum. Here to join me in talking about this is uh, Lisa Wells. She is a criminal defense attorney. Uh, Lisa, can, can you hear me? I can. Good Hi, to see you. Lisa, welcome. Um, so, so I assume you've been following along uh, with this case uh, as, as we have. And, you know, one of the things we've been talking about is how effective is this doctor, um, so far at least, and obviously we haven't even heard the total of his direct examination, nor have we heard what I expect to be a pretty blistering cross-examination. But how effective is he so far, if you can put your, your mind, <laughs> if you were a juror, in, in impacting their decision-making in this case? Well, I have not seen the whole testimony. Um, I've seen just a part of it. So I, I will say, because um, I've had court today, but... Um, I anyway, understand that. Yes, but I will say that um, 
you know, uh, my, of course, it's very important to, to understand um, living with autism. And it's very important for the jurors to understand how that will, you know, affect his capacity. Um, and, um, you know, so it's, it's important. And, you know, he's a very credible type um, witness. So he's, he's coming across well, um, you know, as far as there's so much more to the defense, but as far as this this witness, it's part of the building block of the defense. Um, you know, and, and he's he's a good witness. Sure, and obviously we're going to be hearing a lot more from him, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see what the cross examination has in store for him. We're just going to take a look back and hit some more of his direct examination while we're waiting to get back into the courtroom. Let's take a look. And there you heard it. Uh, Nicholas Godejohn was asked by the judge if, in fact, he was going to testify on his own behalf. He has chosen not to. And not only did he say that, but when asked if he was going to speak, he said, I'm going to wait until you sentence me, um, which is uh, interesting considering he hasn't been found guilty of anything. I want to bring in our panel to discuss this bombshell, although for me, I admit that I'm not that surprised. I know many people thought he might choose to testify, but let's talk to, uh, if we can bring in Jerry Gurley and Lisa Wells uh, on our panel. Let's start with you, Jerry. Is this a surprise to you that he has made the decision not to testify? We can talk about it in a minute, the fact that he said he'll wait till he's sentenced. Uh, but is it a surprise to you that he has made that decision? Uh, no, not at all, and, and especially given the defense of diminished capacity, mental capacity. The only thing he can do on the stand is harm himself and harm his defense. So no, I, more often than not, they're very often very brutal and successful. So no, it's not a surprise to me at all. Yeah, and I, you know, I agree with you. I, I, as far as I was concerned, and Lisa, I'd like your take on this. You know, as far as I'm concerned, he had testified already. The jury has heard from him not just once, but they've heard from him twice. Once when the detective spoke to him after the murder, and we saw that about an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minute tape where he confesses to the murder. And then the second was the interview between himself and one of the news magazines where he speaks about uh, the relationship he had uh, with, um, with Gypsy and the ultimate death of Dee Dee Blanchard. So I assume you two uh, are on the same page that it, it's not surprising that he chose uh, the ultimate decision to not take the stand? It, while it's not surprising and it would be risky, I actually think that in a murder trial, um, and in a lot of these trials, of course, they, people do want to hear from the defendant. And while he does have diminished capacity, um, it was his opportunity to say, instead of how wronged he was by Dee Dee and how betrayed he was by Dee Dee, how fearful he was um, of Dee Dee's life. I, I, you know, almost a justification defense that that she was so trapped, she had nowhere to go. He was scared for her. He loved her, um, you know, and that that he didn't know what was going to happen next and how imminent it could be because, you know, Dee Dee was trapped for so many years and had nowhere to go, and just just his overwhelming concern, love, fear for her. And, and just to try to reach out to the jurors in that way. I mean, you know, we know he has diminished capacity, so we don't expect it to be as articulate as maybe we'd like to hear. But I don't know. I think the jurors may have wanted to hear from him. Um, I know it's risky. It's, it's, it's a hard call, really. Yeah, and I, you know, look, I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to be the jury uh, that, that makes that decision and makes that call. Obviously, they're going to be given the instruction that they can't hold it against him if he chooses not to testify. Obviously, we'll see what the jury does. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. And welcome back. We're uh, following the Nicholas Godijan case out of Missouri. They're presently on a break. They're going to, the defense has rested, and the prosecution, prosecution is going to be bringing on a rebuttal witness. Uh, and so we're going to be hearing from that in a few minutes. I still have my guests with me. I have Lisa Wells um, and Jerry Gurley uh, out of Florida. Um, and I want to talk for a few moments while we're in this break a little bit about how uh, the 
expert witness testified on behalf of the defense. We had heard originally by from when he testified on direct about the autism spectrum that Nicholas Godejan was on. And then cross-examination brought out a few other things. One of the things I noted that they brought out is the fact that this doctor didn't look at everything, didn't look at the text messages between the defendant and Gypsy Blanchard to help make a decision, an expert decision, about whether or not what he was telling him in person was completely accurate as to who the man was when he committed this crime. So let me start with you, Jerry. I know you were probably taking notes about what was going on when this witness was testifying. How do you think he made out on cross-examination? Well, I don't think he did too well. I think that the prosecutor did an excellent job of breaking down the story. There's a couple of ways that you can discredit or impeach a, an expert witness. And one of them is that you can establish in the minds of the jury that the expert's opinion was formulated based upon inadequate or uh, insufficient data, which is, I think he did a great job of that. The other part of the, the cross-examination in which he undermined the, the uh, expert was that he established that the witness was not psychotic. That is, he was able to distinguish between what was real and not real. He also established that the, the witness was um, average. That word average came up two or three times. So uh, he's not impaired intellectually. He's, he was not having a psychotic break. He was average. So there is no justification for his actions. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I think, you know, when we start, when we initially heard from him on direct, we started to think that this was a young man who had a lot of intellectual limitations. And by the end of the cross-examination, I, I, I think we all were viewing it quite differently, that this was a young man with average intelligence. And clearly, when you compare that and bring together that with the cross-examination in, in terms, I'm sorry, with the... Um, evidence that came in with regards to go to John's actions as it were with Gypsy then it kind of brings a different picture one of the things I noted noted and I don't know if you noticed it Lisa was that you know part of the testimony by the doctor was that this you know Asperger's or someone with on the autism spectrum would tend not to be communicative and he used that as an example and as it applied to go to John and what I found that I thought was notable is he gives an entire interview um, to this news reporter where he gives detail upon detail upon detail about his relationship with um, Gypsy and the reasons why they ended up killing this person, which seems completely inconsistent with what the doctor was saying. Yes, and also, I mean, just because he's not that communicative, what point, you know, I mean, that's not that that big of a, a deal to the defense. I mean, what I think the prosecution brought out through cross-examination was that he has the ability to make a plan and carry out a plan. Um, basically, the, the, through the questions, they were proving that he could still deliberate, he could still make a plan, he, you know, knew right from wrong, and um, his, his uh, intelligence was, was not even, even in the mild retardation um, um, spectrum. Um, you know, I, I think, honestly, this is a dangerous defense for the defense um, to, even, <laughs> to even hone in on the autism um, defense. I think more if they, uh, you know, and it's easy to play armchair quarterback, but it seems to me as if they are, um, they should have done more of a justification type defense. I mean, certainly, you know, um, you know, to, to, but autism, to, to demonize someone who is in the autism spectrum, I think is a very dangerous defense. Yeah, you know, I think, I think you're right that a lot of jurors may look at this and say, you know, there's many individuals that have autism. There's individuals that have Asperger's and there's individuals that are on the spectrum and they don't commit these type of crimes. And that's why we talked a little bit, even if they had brought this out, but coupled that with the notion that this defendant viewed um, Gypsy as being someone that was in danger um, and had lived a life of complete and utter torment and in a sense, chose to save her life. Um, one of the things that I think, you know, and I want to go to you, Jerry, about this, is we talked about one of the unique things about this case is that it's the jury not just making the decision about the guilt or non-guilt of the defendant, but 
the jury's making the decision about what the sentencing is. And so this is not, I, I, I've worked in, I, I've prosecuted and done defense in New York my whole life. I can't fathom that the jury would be making such a decision. Uh, but how do you think that at the end of the day um, is going to, you know, impact, you know, how the jury is hearing these various pieces of evidence that do seem to at least mitigate some of the conduct on behalf of the defendant? Well, exactly. We talked about this earlier. The, the defense is number one trying to, to get a, a lesser included offense. Can't get a not guilty when the defendant has confessed at least two different occasions prior to trial. But maybe it can be a lesser included. But then if not a lesser included, there's these mitigating factors. And diminished mental capacity certainly, if established, uh, would justify a, a lesser punishment. And I, I do think that they're making some headway there. Yeah, you know what, I, I, I agree with you. And just so the, the viewers know, we're waiting to go back in the courtroom. As you may or may not know, the defendant has already spoken to the judge outside the presence of the jury. The judge specifically asked him if he understood what was going on. He said yes. And the judge asked him, is he making an informed decision as to whether or not he chooses to testify? The defendant specifically said he will not be testifying. And, and to quote him, he said, I'm going to wait until you sentence me, in which the judge responded that obviously the jury hasn't come to that conclusion and that he's never obligated to speak on his own behalf. I believe that the jury is coming back into the courtroom, um, so maybe we want to take a look. And welcome back. Uh, we're going to be finishing up for the day, and Aaron Keller is going to be doing the daily debrief. Uh, there is a doctor on the stand and a rebuttal witness. Um, I want to take a moment just to thank uh, Lisa Wells and Jerry Gurley uh, for being here. I appreciate all your insight uh, in regards to this case. Um, and we're going to be following up, and we're going to be hearing from Aaron Keller. I'm Julie Rendleman. Thank you for being here at Law and Crime. <laughs>